I welcome you all on behalf of our honorable founder president sir Dr Ashok K Chauhan our chancellor sir Dr Atul Chauhan our vice chancellor ma'am Dr Parvinder Shukla ma'am uh, president astif uh, Dr Selva Murthy sir uh, our uh, dg uh, ast uh, amity science technology innovation uh, alliances uh, for international alliances Dr Rajiv Sharma sir and also scientific advisor to founder president sir so we welcome all the participants who have joined us and who are still joining and uh, we welcome our uh, honorable uh, guest for today dr alister chenry who is uh, from the welcome trust center from university of manchester oxford uh, manchester uk and uh, before i request uh, dr alister chenry to begin his webinar i will just give a brief about his uh, resume so i will just read out so he did his phd in pathology and laboratory medicine from university of british columbia in may 2016 his bsc is in microbiology and immunology from university of british columbia may 2011 and uh, presently he is a post doctoral research associate uh, under professor judy allen university of manchester who is a faculty of biology medicine and health and the project is functional characterization of chitinase like proteins in type 2 immunity his doctoral dissertation was under mentor dr colby zap uh, from university of british columbia and uh, it was on regulation of mucosal t cell responses by intestinal helminthes and rationic acid metabolism he has got uh, many peer reviewed uh, publications out of that uh, the publications are there in mucosal immunology in journal of immunology in stroke in uh, plus path and uh, he has got european in european journal of uh, immunology and uh, presently he is also uh, you know his paper is under review in longitudinal immune profiling reveals distinct features of covid-19 pathogenesis and uh, he had given many presentations uh, in conferences so with these uh, with this brief profile i request uh, professor jenry to give his presentation today and uh, we are eagerly waiting to listen to you so you can share your screen now uh, dr great. jenry yeah thank you so much great thank you uh, harsha for that introduction and uh, And thank you, Amity University, for the invitation to speak today. Uh, it's my pleasure. Um, it's the first of this kind for me to be giving it in this kind of format, and certainly in front of a uh, Indian audience. So that's the first for me. Um, so the title of uh, my presentation I want to kind of talk about today is the Nipostrongulus resiliensis model of type two immunity, and kind of just to give an outline of what I want to talk about today with you. is an overview of what type 2 immunity is and how it pertains to health and disease um i want to introduce the concepts of nematode parasites and how they can be used in experimental research models and finally i just want to kind of apply these models and highlight what our my laboratory judy allen's laboratory group um uses this model in their uh in our research So we're going right into it and kind of wanting to kind of touch on what type 2 immunity is in a very basic sense. So upon um infection uh depending on what the infection is so the type of pathogen that the host encounters uh and the danger signals or molecules that um are sensed uh will very much determine what kind of immune response uh is appropriate to deal with this infection. So when you're encountering a bacteria virus protozoa and this includes coronaviruses um, which is very relevant in this current day uh you generate a so-called type 1 response and this is a very pro-inflammatory cell mediated type immunity uh very destructive um and often the way that these are characterized is based on uh the T cell response so Th1 cells are is very much central to this process and which is why it's called a type 1 response but on the other end of the spectrum uh or when you have a helmet uh, type pathogen so now I'll discuss what helmets are but it's a very distinct response to these types of intracellular type pathogens 
where you generate instead a so-called type two response characterized by a very specific set of cytokines, which are basically the chemical messengers, message signals that are sent between cells to just, you know, to instruct what the immune response should be. And that's very central to what it, what's called a Th2 cell. So what are helminths? Helminths are parasitic worms. Uh, they are multicellular metazoan pathogens, and there are a huge variety of these type of organisms that infect a lot of different animals, different vertebrate hosts. Uh, the main groups that uh, make up helminths are nematodes, flatworms, and segmented worms. And infection with helminths is very important uh, uh, global health burden. Um, so over, over 2 billion human beings have been infected, are inf currently infected with helminths. Uh, and they're broken down into various, uh, uh, you know, species of different helminth worms. So schistosome mansoni can infect over 200 million people. Echinococcus, tania, so these are tapeworms. Uh, Brugia malali, Oncocerca volvolis, these are filarial nematodes that cause uh, elephantitis and other types of maladies in humans. And the big three are these um, soil transmitted helminths. So Ascaris, Lombrocroides, Trichinellus viralis, Trichiris uh, whipworm, um, and the hookworm um, species, which are also um, highly prevalent in humans. In terms of the, the incidence of these helminth infections, uh, they occur largely in tropical uh, areas of the world, and including Sub-Saharan Africa and many parts of uh, South America. Um, and these soil transmitted helminths, as I mentioned, the whipworms, ascaris, and hookworms are very big players in, uh, in uh, causing these uh, diseases. And it's a big global health burden in terms of just the mor morbidity in humans, but also it's also affecting um, agriculture because it also affects uh, livestock, cattle, and all that kind of stuff. Now, very interestingly, if you contrast this to the incidence of immune disease, so this is not uh, infections, but things like asthma, allergic disease, autoimmune disease, you can contrast the incidence of these um, diseases that occur mostly in areas that do not have any helminth infections. And so this, this, uh, this contrasting occurrence led to a very early hypothesis in the um, in the 90s called the hygiene hypothesis, um, where they noted upon, by just tracking over time different types of infections, you can see the decline in through vaccinations or through antibiotics, a lot of different uh, pathogen uh, associated diseases have been declining. Whereas in the same time frame, you've been increased, seeing increased autoimmune and uh, inflammatory diseases such as Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes, asthma, and allergic diseases, uh, which uh, sparked a, a hypothesis that perhaps um, the, the reason that uh, we're seeing this increase in these types of diseases because of the absence of uh, our immune systems not being able trained enough to, uh, you know, properly uh, deal with these kind of uh, insults. And so it, the immune system might turn on itself um, and attack its own tissues. However, this, this is a bit dated and we now know that the, the bigger picture is a lot more complicated. Uh, and in early life, there are many factors that can dictate the development of these inflammatory diseases. Uh, so not only um, the infection history as a, ch as a child, but also the use of antibiotics and um, the presence of vaccines. Also just being close to different animals, um, uh, as well as you know the size of your family, whether you're uh, fed by breast milk or formula, uh, all of these have a huge impact on the development of the immune system, but also the uh, the microbiome in like in our intestines and in our uh, in our bodies, which also has a big role in develop, um, the development of the immune system and our susceptibility to disease. Now, in addition to the fact that infections in our life history have a big impact on our susceptibility to disease. Helminths particularly are interesting because they not only um, cause disease themselves, but are actually also quite uh, the master regulators of the immune system. And that 
they basically co-evolved with human beings for millions of years or millennia and that these um, organisms have very particular strategies to kind of coexist with the host. So this can include, induce, uh, you know, a, a state of tolerance um, instead of uh, calm, like a fighting with the host, it kind of tries to coexist. And this could actually have some benefits because it's been shown that a lot of uh, uh, products that these helmets can secrete actually can be anti-inflammatory. Um, and there's this association with uh, a reduced um, a reduced incidence of inflammatory disease in the presence of these uh, pathogens. Um, so this kind of really kind of uh, shows us a lot about what type two immunity is um, and is a, an important tool of how to understand it. So going back to the concept of type two immunity and we're particularly interested in type two immunity at mucosal sites. So these are the barrier tissue organs such as the lung, the intestine. Uh, which are separated from the environment by just a single layer of epithelial cells. Uh, and upon encountering an helminth, uh, like a worm, this causes tissue damage and exposure of its antigens, which get picked up by these antigen presenting cells called dendritic cells. They migrate to the lymph nodes where they uh, orchestrate antigen presentation to a naive T cell, which causes their differentiation, as I mentioned, to the important central Th2 cell. Uh, and the Th2 cell is responsible for secreting very important chemical messages in these cytokines, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13 are central to the immune response against the helminth, which includes uh, orchestrating B cells to class switch um, towards producing IgE antibodies. So this can have immunity uh, and memory effects uh, that cause protection long-term, but also the recruitment of certain immune cells, such as eosinophils, which are important in uh, both directly killing the helminths, but also in mediating the tissue repair to, uh, uh, to feel the safe, to prepare of the, the tissues that were damaged by this infection, um, as well as uh, sparking the production of mucus production in uh, goblet cells to increase mucus production, turnover, and that kind of basically spits out the helminth to expel the worms. So the outcomes of these type two response are just can be summarized here. There's this weep and sweep parasitic clearance, uh, which just tries to eliminate the pathogen uh, without directly trying to kill it and causing lots of injury to the host. Uh, in addition, there are these tolerance and immune regulation pathways. So these anti-inflammatory uh, molecules can be big players in preventing um, excessive damage, uh, as well as the initiation of tissue repair um, in these, in these settings. And again, as I mentioned with the antibody response, also the induction of memory type uh, immune responses. Now on the same spectrum of type two immune responses, there are also these type two immune diseases. So this includes atopic disorders, uh, allergic inflammation to certain allergens in the environment, asthma, uh, whether it be allergic asthma, uh, as well as tissue fibrosis. Uh, the reason why this is relevant is because the same cell types that are involved in dealing with the helminth insult are actually this, also involved in the pathology of these type two immune diseases such as asthma. Uh, and again, the, the Th2 cell is a big role, plays a big role in orchestrating these pathological diseases, which illustrates kind of the link between uh, why these helminth infections might be, uh, might, um, illustrate very valuable insights into how we can uh, treat these type 2 immune diseases. So this uh, kind of moves on to how we go about in uh, addressing these issues and like trying to understand what these type 2 immune responses are. Uh, and there's a need for research models to, to kind of look at this in depth. Uh, and so what we use are so-called mouse models and the reason why mouse models are very valuable in this setting is because uh, we can take many um, clever genetic approaches to kind of target certain uh, genes of interest that we want to see whether they play a role in type two immunity. So these can be knockout deficient gene animals uh, that we can use um, as models to kind of see whether they contribute to type two immunity as well as um, in this preclinical type of research, we ideally hope that it translates to humans and, 
venture reveals new therapies that we can bring into the clinic. But of course, it's a first step. And so as I mentioned, uh, hookworms are uh, one of the prominent ailments uh, that, we're, that are uh, prevalent in the world. And in this case, uh, so this includes Ancelostoma species as well as Nacator americanus. Uh, in the human setting, this infection occurs when, say, someone barefoot uh, walks on contaminated soil or larvae are able to penetrate into the skin. Uh, they enter through the skin and then go into the circulation. Uh, and then from there, they can get to the lungs where they burrow through the, the lungs, cause extensive tissue damage, and then um, migrate upwards into the esophagus, get swallowed, and then get, um, enter the intestinal tract where they mature, they release eggs into the circulation, or they, sorry, they release eggs into the intestinal tract and they are shed in the feces as eggs back into the soil and that basically completes the life cycle. So it's very simple. There's just a single host here, but uh, it, it is a very complex environment in that they have to transit through different tissue sites in the host. And there's a parallel mouse uh, parasite that we use to kind of test, uh, to study these systems in the lab. Uh, this is the Nipostrongulus brasiliensis uh, parasite. It is also a hookworm. It's a hookworm parasite of uh, rodents, such as rats and mice and other types of uh, animals. Uh, and basically, we can infect mice subcutaneously in the skin. Uh, by about 24 hours, they reach the, the lung and then cause uh, very visible hemorrhaging and tissue damage, uh, as you can see here. Uh, by about 48 hours, they completely leave the lung. Uh, this damage is completely repaired rapidly. Uh, and then they make their way to the intestine and complete the life cycle by shedding eggs, et cetera. So this is a very simple model that we can use, uh, again, using gene deficient mice to better assess uh, these kind of questions. So as a type two model, uh, Nipostrongus brasiliensis infection has these kind of features. As I mentioned, there's uh, direct tissue damage to the lung and our focus of the lab is very interested in these dynamics of tissue injury and repair. So it is a great quick model to kind of assess that uh, you get recruitment of pro-inflammatory neutrophils in the early stages, uh, and this is to largely combat the, the larvae that are uh, migrating through the tissues. And then you get the subsequent development of the type 2 response uh, to repair this tissue damage, uh, but also to generate a memory response so that if you were to re-challenge a, a mouse that was already exposed to this hel helminth, they would be largely resistant to a subsequent challenge. Uh, and a, this is a great model, as I mentioned, of uh, assessing how rapid re repair occurs in this injured lung. As you can see here in this histological image, um, a helminth larvae, this uh, nipostrongulus, burrowing through the lung tissue causing damage. And again, just to remind you, uh, a big part of this is um, orchestrated by T cells, such as the Th2 cell and uh, the cytokines that they produce. And so kind of just to highlight uh, what the Allen lab is um, focused on and using these types of models and understanding type two immunology, we're interested in the cellular and molecular mechanisms of type two immunity. Uh, we have a keen interest as well in just the, the basic parasite immunology. So the immune response against these pathogens uh, and how the pathogens might uh, manipulate the host and vice versa, but also interest we're interested in understanding the, the factors that control tissue injury and repair. So just to kind of illustrate the hierarchy of what, uh, what we do in our lab. So we have these helminth infections that lead to the, the development of a type two response and uh, type two cytokine secretion. This uh, stimulates production of so-called chitinase-like proteins, uh, which I will focus on today uh, more completely. Uh, and these um, types of proteins and molecules um, or effector proteins also dictate the outcome of the, the tissue repair response, which um, we think are um, very important in this overall context. So why, why do we look at uh, chitinase-like proteins? And kind of to, uh, to kind of put a better, in the bigger picture, I'll just kind of cover what chitin and chitinase enzymes do. Uh, so chitin, is, 
is a polymer, a uh, fibrous kind of uh, polymer that's found in uh, many organisms ranging from uh, helminths, as I mentioned before, but also in the exoskeleton of uh, insects. Uh, it's also found in uh, fungi or fungus type of organisms, cell walls. Uh, and chitin is important because upon, because its chitin is not made by mammalian hosts, uh, such as us, uh, it is seen as a danger signal in the body. Um, and very often this is a, a big trigger of a type two immune response, because uh, largely it tells the body that uh, there is this multicellular organism outside of the cell that we need to deal with. So this is kind of a way to that it orchestrates the type two response and there are pathways that are specifically triggered by this, uh, this molecule. Now, because this can be very um, dangerous to like, be constantly exposed to these chitin uh, type molecules, there's the enzymes called chitinases, which are glycosyl hydrolases. Um, basically, they degrade these chitin molecules, these uh, polysaccharides. Uh, they are very highly conserved. And so you can find these in flies, in many different um, kingdoms. Um, and it's considered a, a highly conserved host defense mechanism, uh, these chitinase enzymes. Now, interestingly, uh, the fact that despite that there being a very broad range of chitinase enzymes, there have also been um, the occurrence of these chitinase-like proteins. So CLPs are recent gene duplication events. So they emerged from chitinases, but because of uh, these uh, loss of function mutations, they basically lack the enzymatic capability to degrade chitin, uh, and thus, thus their molecular functions are unknown. Uh, but because uh, the reason why that we're so interested in these chitinase-like proteins is because they occur heavily during infections, um, allergy, asthma, wound healing, cancers, and many, you can name um, many other different pathological settings in disease. They're basically a biomarker of uh, inflammation um, so, which is very interesting for us and which is why we want to uh, further dissect what their molecular function is. So in the mouse, uh, one of the main chitinase-like proteins we're interested in is called YM1. Uh, it has, uh, this is just the crystal structure shown here and it's bound to uh, a glucosamine uh, ligand. Uh, YKL40 is the, what we believe to be the paralog of uh, humans that has a very similar function to YM1. Uh, it's also bound here to a uh, glicnac uh, oligosaccharide. Um, and what we do know, despite the, the unknown nature of these molecules that go heavily increased during disease, is that the fact that they are classified as lectins, so CLPs combined to glycosaminoglycans, uh, such as heparin and heparin sulfate, uh, and that's pretty much the extent of what we know. Uh, so as, as you can see here, when we do perform just a simple biochemical binding assay, YM1, the CLP, um, upon increasing um, presence of heparin, um, you get an increased uh, level of binding activity. So that's, that's pretty much all we know about um, biochemically what these proteins do, despite the fact that they, so, they are so abundant during disease. And what we think might be happening is that they are associating with uh, these gags, like in the extracellular matrix, um, which could have you know, pretty strong roles in uh, the immune response. And uh, so in studies um, performed by uh, Tara Sutherland, who was previously in the lab, but now is kind of a, her own independent PI that we still uh, closely work with, uh, she wanted to assess um, what CLPs are expressed during infection with lipostrongulus. So upon infection with NIPO, uh, she assessed different types of chitinase-like proteins um, by genetic means, but also by uh, visually through immunostaining. And as you can see here, uh, YM1 um, was one of the most prominent chitinase-like proteins that was expressed during um, hypostrongitis infection, at least in the later stages. So KIL3, which is the gene that encodes YM1, was more abundant um, upon exposure to an allergen, but as well during infection with nipostrongulus. And you can see this illustrated here visually um, by immunohistochemistry uh, that compared to PBS-treated control mice, mice that were uh, anesthet or 
sensitized to the allergen um, ova, uh, you can see the expression of these, this YM1 protein occurring in the large uh, airway epithelial cells, but also in uh, macrophages, uh, kind of uh, proximal to this. Now, in terms of um, to get at what YM1 does, so this was to kind of establish what the function of YM1 might be during this nipostrongulus resiliensis infection. Uh, we developed the tools in the lab to block the function of YM1 during this infection. So uh, we developed an antibody to YM1 that we can inject into the mice and then um, subsequently perform the infection. And what we found to start off with was that upon blockade of IM1 function, while control antibody treated mice have this influx of pro-inflammatory neutrophils upon infection with the parasite, there was this massive uh, reduction in neutrophils in being able to infiltrate into the airways in the absence of YM1. So this kind of suggests that YM1 is controlling the recruitment of neutrophils uh, during nipostrongus infection. You can see this visually here uh, with this myeloperoxidase staining, which marks the neutrophils in the airway. Uh, in a control antibody-treated mice, they're readily inf infiltrating into the tissues here and are massively reduced if you block YM1. So why are neutrophils an important player in this infection? Well, as I mentioned, they are one of the first responding granulocyte type cells to uh, respond to the infection. And the reason is because they can actually swarm the larvae. So you can see kind of the, the shape of the larvae here. They're basically being surrounded by these neutrophils. Um, and they play a role in the di directly damaging the parasite. So that uh, definitely um, affects the resistance to the, the helminth infection. Um, and that consequently um, was shown here when you just measured the worms that eventually made it to the intestine. Uh, upon blocking YM1, um, as, because you reduce the level of neutrophil infiltration and swarming of these larvae, that basically increased the amount of parasites that survived and was able to uh, make the mouse more susceptible to the infection, suggesting that YM1 is definitely an important molecule in controlling parasite numbers in this response. So to follow up on this, and as I mentioned, we're also very much interested in the the tissue repair response that occurs during this uh, um, insult to the lungs. Uh, so as you can see here in control antibody treated mice that get infected with nipostrongulus, so this is just uh, uninfected um, tissue which looks normal. Upon day two infection, um, in, this is the time point when the parasites have migrated through the tissues and caused extensive damage and bleeding. So you can see the gaps in the airway, the, the hemorrhaging and blood uh, that occurs uh, but gets rapidly repaired. Well, if you block YM1 uh, at this time point upon infection, um, you reduce the level of this damage. Uh, and we believe that's because neutrophils, while they are beneficial in killing the, the parasite, they also have an off-target effect of causing tissue injury to the host because they release a lot of toxic uh, mediators that can damage not just the parasite, but also the host tissues. Uh, and this is just quantified by uh, linear mean intercepts, which just basically uh, measures the, the holes that occur uh, during this infection in the lung tissue. And um, later on, Tara Sutherland uh, went on to kind of dissect uh, possible other effects of YM1 during this infection model. Uh, and so as you can see here in this time course, so on uninfected mice to day two, four, and six post-infection. Uh, she basically just tracked the levels of YM1. And as you can see, uh, YM1 is just gradually increasing upon um, over time. And uh, in blue, you can just see here um, the anti-YM1 treatment. Now, I wanna also bring up this other effector molecule, which we believe to be very relevant to this repair response. Uh, it's called Realm Alpha in the mouse. Uh, upon infection, this also increases during uh, the helminth infection, but is heavily actually dependent on YM1 because if you block it here in blue, you reduce the levels of uh, realm alpha that are present in the, the, 
bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. So that's basically a measure of the airway uh, proteins. Now, as I mentioned, we can also assess the, the level of these, the, the, these responses using genetically deficient mice. So the IL-4 receptor alpha, uh, IL-4 being one of the key cytokines involved in the type two response. So if you knock that out, uh, you basically get no type two immunity. Uh, and you can see that here, because YM1 and realm alpha are uh, major effector pro uh, proteins that are expressed during a type two response, you basically get no, res no expression compared to a wild type mouse that gets heavy increased expression of realm alpha in the airway epithelial cells, as well as the production of YM1 in immune cells, uh, which is completely abrogated upon infection with uh, NIPO in an IL-4 receptor alpha knockout mouse. So that just illustrates the fact that these proteins are heavily dependent on IL-4 receptor alpha signaling. And that the fact that if you knock out realm alpha itself, so comparing uh, a realm alpha, so sorry, this is resistant like alpha, this is just the gene uh, notation here, but a sufficient animal that uh, basically wild type for this gene, uh, by day six post-infection, they um, largely repair the damage to the tissue, but in the absence of realm alpha, so in the case of a realm alpha knockout animal, uh, you just see a progressively worsening um, phenotype of the, of the tissue. So without realm alpha, you get worse tissue damage. Uh, and we believe this is because realm alpha is critical in uh, driving repair responses after nipostrongyrus infection. So um, in this uh, follow-up study, um, as we established that YM1 has a role in the early response, so the recruitment of neutrophils, we were also interested in uh, understanding what does YM1 do in the later stages of the infection. Uh, so to address this, Tara uh, had this model where upon infection with Nipostrongulus, uh, she depleted the function of YM1 using, again, anti-YM1 antibody or control, IgG, uh, at these later time points and then looking at uh, day six post-infection. And what was found uh, was that if you blocked the later YM1 um, influx, uh, you basically abrogate the type two res immune response itself. Uh, or actually, no, um, sorry, I should clarify that if you blocked YM1 in these later stages, you actually limit the the ability of YM1 to regulate the type 2 immune response. Uh, as you can see by just um, the CD4 positive cell production of um, IL-5 and IL-13, as well as uh, possibly the influx of eosinophils into the lung tissue. Later, she showed that uh, by blocking um, YM1 late, uh, the CLP, you also um, in exacerbate the, the repair response. So even though YM1 might promote uh, neutrophilia early on and cause uh, an acute tissue damage, if you block YM1 completely, uh, this has kind of a double-edged sword that you also block the pro-repair response. And because of the fact that you're likely inhibiting the ability to uh, induce realm alpha, which again is that critical uh, repair enzyme a repair molecule uh, critical to this process. And you can see that here, not only through the increased injury based on uh, mean linear intercepts, but also uh, when you perform other kind of immunohistological stains, such as um, looking for the presence of um, iron deposits in macrophages. So because of the increased um, uh, presence of red blood cells during this bleeding response, these iron deposits accumulate in the macrophages, which you can stain chemically using a Prussian blue type stain. So the, the more blue, the more bleeding that there was in, in this animal. So by blocking YM1, you actually enhance uh, bleeding and uh, this goes with the increased injury that we saw. And to kind of establish that the, the dependence on this relationship between YM1 and the pro-repair and molecule realm alpha, 
she also visualized uh, this by antibody staining by immunofluorescence. Uh, as you can see in an infected animal that's just treated with a control antibody, you get a, a robust induction of realm alpha expression in airway epithelial cells in green here. Whereas if you block YM1 with an antibody, you completely um, disrupt this induction and uh, you, get a, you get a failure to induce this pro repair factor realm alpha, illustrating the importance of YM1 in this later stage in repair. Now, very interestingly, uh, as I mentioned, IL-4 is a very central uh, player in um, the development of a type two immune response. Uh, so if you, if you infect an IL-4 receptor alpha knockout mouse with nipostrongulus, you would get almost no induction of the pro-repair factor realm alpha. However, if you take the same knockout animal during an infection, but treat it with a recombinant YM1, you can rescue the an induction of this repair protein uh, in the airways. And this largely leads to outcomes of improved repair responses that otherwise wouldn't occur uh, in the absence of type two immunity, um, illustrating kind of a IL-4 independent effect of YM1 in these later repair stages of the model. So that was kind of a brief uh, introduction and uh, overview of what our lab is um, interested in. Um, I hope I've illustrated uh, that type two responses are critical for both anti-helminth immune responses, but also for the tissue repair um, functions. Um, and there's this idea that parasitic infections have actually been the evolutionary driver and selective pressure on hosts to develop uh, tissue repair strategies because they are so large and cause a lot of um, extensive tissue damage that these were likely key events in our his like our life history that caused um, the development of these repair pathways. Um, and I've hoped that I've also kind of covered, albeit briefly, the, the importance and the power of this Nipostrongulus resiliensis model, how it is a robust uh, model to understand type two immunity, uh, at least in the preclinical sense. And that uh, by using this model, uh, we were able to highlight the importance of these emerging host effector proteins that we are interested in, such as CLPs, chitinase-like proteins, and how they regulate overall type two immunity, which we hope uh, might translate to certain, certain like therapeutics that we can investigate in the future. So in terms of future directions and what and where this work is kind of lead, led us in, in general for the lab is to kind of further tease out what the biochemical function of, the, of YM1 and other chitinase-like proteins are. And so we do have collaborations with uh, sugar biochemists to kind of assess this in a more molecular sense um, using mutant proteins um, that we can give back to the mice um, recombinantly uh, during this infection model. We also want to assess the role of these chitinase-like proteins in extracellular matrix uh, interactions, such as possibly through these glycosaminoglycan interactions. Uh, and we also want to study the role of CLPs in novel emerging diseases. Um, so we do have um, studies ongoing about what these chitinase-like proteins are doing in um, cases like COVID-19 uh, as our, as our um, university has been involved in uh, collecting patient samples and studying and performing longitudinal uh, profiling of this disease. So hopefully that might um, not only illustrate some important aspects of chitinase-like proteins uh, in the pathology of COVID-19, but also to further elucidate what, what uh, their molecular function is in a broader sense. So with that, uh, I'd like just to thank uh, members of Judy Allen's group, uh, past and present, as well as our close collaborators uh, in our core facilities. And I thank you as well for hosting me and uh, allowing me to kind of talk about um, our work. And I look forward to any kind of questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Alistair. And it was a wonderful uh, to listen to you on uh, Nipo Stronglysis uh, Brasilinesis infection model of uh, type 2 immunity. And we have few questions. And uh, uh, before I request our esteemed panelists uh, to uh, 
you know to express their views and add on on our collaborations what we had discussed uh, i uh, can i take few questions before uh, ma'am uh, answer okay so uh, there are few questions and uh, everyone is appreciating your talk uh, dr alister this is from our uh, dr rajendran he is asking uh, does it cause any other disease in humans or other organism and is it related to gut region uh, or not right so in terms of uh, whether the the like just to clarify do you think you mean does they mean the the parasite itself if it causes yeah. other diseases yeah yeah, yeah. um uh, not generally. So the it d depends on the, the the burden or the dose of the infection. So I think in general, if you have a low presence of these parasitic organisms, it can be very silent and people won't know that they actually have the infection. It's only during this heavy burdens with multiple parasites mm. that you start to get uh, the morbidities that you can see visibly, um, especially in children. Um, okay. And in terms of whether it's uh, related to the gut region, um, yes, definitely. Like, I mean, there's the mucosal immune system is interconnected. So, the, what's happening in one particular organ will influence the other. So, the fact that something's occurring in the lung might influence what's happening in the gut during that phase of the infection, and vice versa. And there's definitely been evidence that this is the case. Uh, while we we largely focus on the lung, um, that's definitely something we can. Uh, focus on in future studies is uh, what's happening in the gut. Yeah. So I think uh, lung plays important role in COVID-19 and that is why, you know, it's such an important model that you're working and you are getting the samples also. So it's a yes. plus point, you know, and I hope uh, just like Oxford, uh, you also come up with, uh, you know, some kind of uh, uh, therapy for uh, COVID-19. So another, the other question is uh, from uh, Dr. Mahin. She's asking, are all elementals have uh, rhabdiform uh, larvae? Is there any filariform helminthus infect, uh, like, is there any uh, helminthus which infect humans also, like, apart from this? Um, so I'm not too familiar with uh, rhabdiform larvae. So I'm not, I wouldn't classify myself as a, a parasitologist in that sense because yeah, I yeah. mostly use uh, yeah I mostly just use the parasites as a model so I'm, I'm very much more of an immunologist so I apologize for not yeah. uh, knowing that answer okay uh, the next question is from Dr. Anjana she's asking could you please explain how uh, N. brasilensis reached the target organ lungs from the site of infection right Yes, so the site of infection is starts in the skin, so we inject it uh, subcutaneously just under the skin. Uh, the parasites, larvae, they basically burrow actively into the tissues and then they get into the circulation, the blood, bloodstream. And by getting into the bloodstream, they are basically readily pumped into uh, the lungs because that's a very um, bloody, like rich in blood um, and circulation. So that that's how it directly gets to the lung. And by that, we believe that they get uh, trapped into the capillaries of the lung, which causes them to uh, sig uh, have signals that allow them to burrow and um, egress through the tissues and back into the pulmonary tract. Okay, okay. And uh, this I wanted to ask, like you're working on chitinase-like proteins and chitin. So are you looking forward for other polysaccharides also because uh, we also have a range of uh, novel polysaccharides in our lab and uh, we have worked on chitin, pululan and other for, uh, you know, and there are many pharmacy people also have joined us uh, for drug delivery and for other aspects like uh, we have been dervatizing them and using them for different purposes. But if it can be used against COVID-19 because you're looking for COVID uh, like chitinase like proteins uh for uh, you know for covid 19 so uh, can uh, like uh, is there any scope for other polysaccharides like what was the reason why did you choose only chitin among all the polysaccharides uh, i just wanted to know that 
Right. Well, um, not necessarily chitin per se, but we're interested in the, the glycosaminoglycans. Um, so we definitely, one thing that we don't know for sure about uh, what these chitinase-like proteins do is what their lig ligands are. Okay. Um, and we are definitely interested in screening for what other sugars and other type of molecules uh, it might be able to bind to, because that's still something that needs to be worked out, um, whether it's other GAGs or as you mentioned, maybe some other polysaccharides of interest. Yeah. Um, and that'd be something very interesting for us yeah. to pursue. Yeah. So uh, maybe, you know, uh, having similar activity like chitin. So that's all on the questions part because the other question is also whether it's pl uh, it plays a role in any other older disease. So uh, is there any answer to it? Like Dr. Rajendran only asked this. Uh, does this organ, does this helminth which you have taken, has any role to play in uh, diseases which have like been there, like uh, if you see like diabetes or you know, any right. genetic related diseases? So, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, they, the fact that um, immunotherapies are a key interest in these kind of infections, um, there have been clinical trials on not just the, the infections themselves, but the products that are secreted by these helmets. And they found that there's actually some benefit, say in live hookworm infections, in um, celiac disease. So the like uh, allergies to like food, that kind of stuff in the gut uh, seems to calm down a lot of the, uh, the symptoms of uh, these inflammatory diseases in the colon because uh, they release these, pro these regulatory um, proteins that seem to dampen down the inflammation. And so we're, the hope is that we can develop new therapies based on the fact that helmets are so uh, powerful in their ability to manipulate the host. Yeah. Um, so that kind of, I think, I'm not too sure with the studies whether it was able to reverse pre-existing. I believe they were pre-existing conditions because um, they were enrolled as patients. Okay, thank you. Dr. So Alice, yeah. uh, uh, Alistair Chiani, I enjoyed your talk. I was listening to every part of your presentation. I just you. wanted you to reflect on one or two comments with uh, regard to the cytokine storms which we encounter in COVID-19. And when you looked at immune response one and immune response two, primarily the immune response one would be dealing with uh, the interleukins which are connected with viral infection. Yes. Some of the interleukins and cytokines which you have shown in type 2 immune response is also uh, might play a role. So I want you to uh, comment on whether the uh, airway inflammation and the alveolar inflammation which you find in COVID condition can also be linked to this type 2 immune response. But uh, is it primarily to immu uh, type 1 immune response? I just wanted one comment on that. Yeah, so I think um, it's not, it's kind of oversimplified things in a way that I think in general, these responses are mixed. Uh, you often get a pro-inflammatory early response, but then eventually you get this type two response. Um, in terms of how it relates to COVID, I think that's very interesting because there are some studies that now suggest that there are type two markers involved, such as IL-13. Uh, that are also implicated in the pathology of uh, the COVID-19. So maybe not directly relevant to the actual response to the virus itself, like killing infected cells, but also because there is a lot of uh, fibrosis that occurs in COVID-19 patients. So IL-13 definitely plays a role in the fibrotic response, which is why uh, we're very interested in how these type 2 markers also might be relevant in COVID-19 and fibrosis. Yes, so the matrix formation, the fibrosis happens because of this type 2 immune response, which yes, is and also would... trying to put a barrier for infection to be limited. Yes, and ultimately yes. it causes a residual long term effect on respiratory function itself. The title was yes. the compliance of the lung. The whole yes. gets disturbed because of uh, the fibrosis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and there's also the element of um, clotting as well because of that injury that occurs uh, from the immunopathology. Uh, we also believe that some of these uh, molecules are also involved in the clotting response, which is 
also um, kind of um, turning out to be the case that uh, COVID-19 is not just a simply a respiratory disease, but also a systemic blood-borne disease. Is there anybody from our AIBA also attending this, uh, Harsha? And how do you how do you plan to connect with him uh, yeah. for the future as well? Sir, uh, uh, like he's uh, uh, Dr. Alistair's, uh, like we spoke, and he's open to joint uh, collaborations and projects and uh, also for joint publications. And uh, eventually other things will also line up. So he's open for collaborations. And I told him about uh, our Department of Stem Cell Research of Biotechnology. We have a virology department. I told that, you know, we have got the best lab in Asia for stem cell research. And we have got the best scientists for uh, virology here in Amity University. And uh, we also have a team. Uh, we have, uh, in fact, uh, uh, just like uh, we have a society for uh, uh, COVID-19 also for virologists uh, oh, excellent. Which is looking after and uh, because uh, your work is so much relevant to COVID-19 and you have got all the resources so definitely uh, the we will send you uh, you know the probable uh, scientists will give them your uh, details and they can connect you for uh, joint collaborations for PhDs and manuscripts and other things uh, you know, sir can add on. Like, any any comment Kaushik. from Dr. Nutan Kaushik? Nutan. And Rajiv Sharma, sir. Yes. And Rajiv Sharma. Sir. Ma'am, please uh, unmute. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, again it is muted. Sir, Sharma sir first, then I will talk. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sharma ji. I Yeah. Yeah. So, but I am from Lucknow, so Pele Yeah. So, uh, it was really very interesting talk, actually, and uh, uh, totally uh, layman like me, actually, I, I could understand a lot of things from this. Uh, uh, coming to actually collaboration part, yes, actually. Uh, we have actually the provisions also actually like uh, India has very good collaboration with UK RI and uh, through that we can certainly uh, submit the proposal. Every year the call comes uh, here our Ministry of Science and Technology uh, they issue the call for proposals. So I'm sure actually our people can join, join actually with the people uh, yeah, your group also and other people also with your help maybe we other people also we can approach for submitting uh, research uh, projects in this thing. Uh, yes, yes, I think in general, like uh, cooperation and collaboration is going to be the key to yeah. um, better understanding these kind of diseases. And it definitely um, should be open to these kind of uh, opportunities. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Dr. Lister. It was such a nice presentation. i sorry I missed you. Missed your part of presentation because there was a problem in my uh i think uh, audio system in my laptop so i was just trying to rectify okay. it so i have just two questions uh, one is that uh, you mentioned about the chitinase chitin and all that so uh, are you also looking uh, do you think that the chitin which is we recovered from chitosan uh, will also have the similar impact or it will have some different one so because by, we have a lot of marine raw rest raw material available which can be sourced, sourced as a, uh, for extraction of the chitin. Like we have shells and all these crabs and all that, which contains a lot of chitin and chitosan, and from there we can extract a lot of chitin. That's one question. Second thing, do uh, you think that uh, your model can uh, be used for testing of the natural products, like plant-based natural products? So that's second question. Um, yeah, so for the first question, I think definitely uh, to be able to kind of look at the derivatives of chitin or the other related molecules, that would be very interesting to see, um, especially whether chitinase like proteins can bind to these different uh, uh, variations of chitin or chitosan. Um, and for the second question, definitely the, the fact that this model is so quick, um, you can basically uh, expose the mice to whatever type of uh, immune modulator or natural product or compound um, very easily in a certain defined time frame. Uh, to mm -hmm. test whether you can have a protective or effect of these uh, of these products. That's great because we have 
list of uh, Ayurvedic plants which had been like shown to show the immunity boosters or something like that. And uh, uh, so it will be interesting if we can test those extracts for this efficacy because we are just looking for the models because we just can't test in the COVID-19. So that's, that's really great, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we will definitely looking forward to this collaboration. And uh, Harsha herself is uh, leading this natural product group in uh, MIT University. So I think Harsha, we should take this uh, that also. Yes, ma'am. And yeah. I spoke, sir, uh, Dr. Shweta Dubey. I think she is from virology in uh, in the audience. Uh, Shweta, you have any comment because uh, you. You are a, a professor there in Amity Institute of Biology and Immunology. Yeah. You can ask her to be promoted as panelist here. Yeah. IT, yeah. IT, yeah. IT, ah, yeah. IT person has there. taken, yes. Sir. Can okay. you just uh, make some comment? You can activate your uh, yeah. the camera also, video as well as uh, audio. Audio. You are, you are muted. Shweta Dube. I think. Uh, yeah. Are you just uh, unmute and speak? Yeah, you can just unmute and speak if the video is not because you know, uh, Doctor Alistair, because of uh, everything is online, so sometimes internet, you know. Yeah, the, yeah, it's and neutral. It takes time. Yeah, connectivity sometimes becomes an issue. It took me about uh, forty-five minutes to rejoin. <laughs> <laughs> So, Dr. Uh, Alistair, meanwhile, uh, till uh, we get proposals and all, maybe uh, uh, we can send you some write-ups and uh, somewhere where we, uh, you know, both the uh, Welcome Trust Center and Amity can collaborate. Uh, we have so many, uh, you know, specialized departments in Amity and uh, uh, very well, uh, you know, uh, many good publications. Uh, when you see there are publications, in nature, in the leading journals, uh, with very high citations, and as I told Hi, you, that Dr. Shweta Dube, I think she's uh, there is some internet issue at her end, sir. Okay. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah, please continue, sorry. No, no, I was just telling. So uh, we will send you, uh, you know, meanwhile all those collaborations, and maybe right. uh, then we can you know, uh, move ahead with that, you know, and uh, as you told, uh, you will, you will also send us details of uh, your mentor, Professor uh, Julia and other people, so that we can really look forward because we have all the departments. And presently, as ma'am also said, like, right from natural product extract, to the polysac rights to virology to stem cell research, and uh, yeah. Our Dean, Dr. B.C. Das, sir, of Health and Allied Sciences, he's Hargobind Kur uh, Kurana, you know, chair professor. He has worked on uh, human papilloma virus along with the Nobel laureate. He was the one. So, and uh, so we have got all the, uh, you know, departments and uh, uh, we can really uh, do a very good uh, collaborative work. And uh, eventually we look forward for a welcome press center um, at Amity because uh, there were few uh, like uh, from biotechnology uh, there were few scientists who could visit Welcome Press Center um, in UK so definitely uh, you know uh, with all these departments with all the specializations uh, we look forward and because your work is related to lungs and uh, as uh, and especially of fibrosis, because when there is community spread of COVID-19, I think it is only, uh, you know, uh, the fibrosis part because the lung becomes totally solid, it's fibroid, and that's why it leads to death. So I think uh, it's a very good lead that you have got. And uh, with, uh, with the lead that uh, the scientists uh, at Amity that they have got, we can really uh, have a very good, fruitful collaboration. Yes, that, that sounds very promising and hopefully that uh, we can have some mutual kind of connections there established. Yes, yes. We will send you a mail uh, most probably in a week, 10 days time, you will get a mail from our side that I promise like uh, that we can just, we will send your details to everyone and then uh, we can have everyone's ideas. We are very, very 
enthusiastic scientists and who have worked abroad and then they have come back to serve india again so great dr chenri it has been wonderful listening to you thank you very much and yeah. uh, we'll keep in touch dr harsha congratulations It's, you you keep organizing so many webinars and my best wishes to you and dr thank Mitchell. you sir uh, the in, the society you are uh, amiti society for natural products yes. you are bringing it in a big way and my best wishes to you thank you so much thank you sir so on behalf of honorable founder president sir chancellor sir vice chancellor ma'am and all, uh, on behalf of president astif uh, dg uh, you know amiti institute of uh, international alliances uh, from dr nutin koshik ma'am and from all faculty from um, amity fraternity i thank you for joining us today dr alistair and we'll be in touch so thank you so much thank you for joining thank you thank you it was a great Same pleasure to speak with you same here thank you good thing bye bye bye, bye.